Great. So welcome, everybody. So my name is John Leary. I'm a senior researcher with uh, MEX Pro. Um, and yeah, thank you for joining us today for the first in a series of webinars uh, designed to link together businesses active in the, the world of modern energy for cooking um, with the opportunities that we see emerging in many countries around the world today. Um, so as a brief introduction to the, the MEX program itself, MEX, or the Modern Energy Cooking Services Program, is a UK government funded research and innovation program. Um, four million people, four billion people, sorry, around the world today lack access to modern energy cooking services, but, and most of these are still cooking with solid biomass. So this results in over four billion deaths every year from indoor air pollution. Harvesting of biomass is also a major contributor to environmental challenges such as climate change, forest degradation, and of course there's the issue of gender equity, as the majority of cooks in, in developing countries are women, and this results in lost time um, and opportunity. So solving the clean cooking challenge is really important globally, but it's proved elusive so far. So we're hoping that uh, the new opportunities that are opening up um, will be able to enable more people to transition from solid biomass and other polluting fuels directly to cooking with modern energy. In particular, there are less than 1 billion people in the world today without access to electricity. This means that there are several billion who are cooking with <coughs> solid biomass and other polluting fuels but still have access to some form of electricity. There's also new technologies and business models that are opening up electric cooking to a wider group, a variety of consumers. So in the webinar today and, the, and those that will follow in this series, we hope to, to show you some of the opportunities that our partners are, are taking to, to explore these new, uh, this, this new potential for cooking with modern energy in context that have previously been dominated by traditional fuels. So I'd like to hand over to, to Nick Rousseau, who has been leading the development of these webinars, to give a brief introduction to the report that accompanies them on the affordability gap. So Nick, over to you first. Thanks, John. Can you hear me OK? Am I audible? Yes, Nick, go for, go for yeah. it. OK, good. Thank you, everyone. Um, so John's introduced MEX. Uh, my role within MEX is I'm employed at Loughborough University to work with companies that are in the cooking solutions sector, um, whether they are international companies developing cooking devices for all over the world, or whether they are more uh, in country, um, or they are manufacturers that work on behalf of some of the big brands. Um, and we've got a lot of interest in what we're talking about, um, but also a lot of questions. Um, a lot of the companies are used to operating within Western markets. They are used to working on providing quite complex, sophisticated cooking devices for people who can afford to pay a high price. <clears throat> and so one of the questions is, how can people in developing countries afford what are seen to be um, more premium products, because um, we don't want to just have the market dominated by poor quality um, substandard ones. So the uh, issue that they raised is something that we've taken seriously. And as a result, I worked with a number of colleagues to put together a paper on what I call the affordability gap. And it set out in the report a number of different ways you can approach the question of um, addressing the gap that clearly does exist between people who don't have substantial income and yet who need and would benefit from um, more sophisticated cooking devices than they're currently using. Um, so the report covers things like, you know, making sure you properly understand the market and the different segments so you can target appropriately, the kind of finance that you can leverage and how different business models can make a big difference in enabling people to afford the, the prices that are associated with these devices. And promoting them effectively, helping people to understand the, the value proposition of cooking with electricity uh, and cooking with your devices. And so we thought that the report hopefully is useful, but nothing quite like a series of webinars to really bring it alive um, and to create some buzz and excitement and, and also conversation around the topics. And so we've been having discussions with the Shell Foundation uh, and other partners um, 
on how we do engage with businesses more broadly uh, on some of the challenges associated with what we're doing. And so we've set up a series of seminars, two of which are going to happen in the next couple of months, um, and then a further set later in the year. But we'll be looking at uh, issues, uh, and as John said, some of the solutions that uh, companies um, and organizations have found that work for them. Some of these solutions are still at an early stage, um, but there's some practical experiences which I think we can all learn from. Um, so today's session, you're going to hear from four people who've got practical experience of promoting electric cooking to different markets uh, around uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and sub Southeast Asia and India. Um, and on the 6th of July, we've got another of these, which is focusing on consumer finance, which we're doing in partnership with Energy for Impact and ACTS in Kenya. So I hope that you'll find this one helpful and that you'll sign up for further ones. That's uh, probably enough for me. I'll hand over back to John. Thank you. So in case you've just joined us, then please be aware that we are recording the session today. Um, if you're not comfortable with being recorded, then please do uh, put questions in the chat um, rather than ask out loud. Um, I would encourage anybody who does have a question so we're going to the presentation to put it into the chat and we will come to them at the at the end of the presentation. Um, we do hopefully have a, a period for, for questions and answers at, at the end where we will get into a into a discussion. We can ask the questions that come in the chat and also several questions that we hope will um, we hope will guide the, the session today. Um, in particular, we'd like to try and answer what, what the key messages are um, that will really affect consumers' decisions in the shift towards modern energy for cooking. We'd like to try and showcase some of the research that makes us done, that sheds light on this. Um, what media or intermediaries are the most effective in getting these messages across? What concerns consumers have that need to be addressed um, in any marketing campaign, and how effective demonstrations, free trials, community, influence, uh, community influences, and trained sales teams might be. So these are some of the things that we would like to try, try and cover, but please do put your questions that you have in the chat, and we can come back to, the, to them at the end of the session. Um, so the theme of the session today, um, it is on the promotion of modern energy for cooking, so looking at how we can connect with consumers, in markets which may be unfamiliar. And we hope that going through some of these examples today of how our partners have, have reached out to consumers um, and how they've connected with them, the messages that they've used, may be able to, to inspire you to, to connect with some of these partners and to use similar messages in the marketing of the products and services that you may already um, be marketing in other contexts. So we have four speakers for you today, the first of whom is Andy Billich, who's a data systems and an analytics manager for Earthspark International in Haiti. The second is Rocio Perez, the co-founder and director of Bida Sasa in Kenya. The third is Amai Bansod, a design strategist um, for IDE Cambodia and their innovation lab. And the third is Vishaka Chanderi, uh, the founder of Audiobox, who are promoting clean cooking through de demonstrations and linking to livelihoods in, in India. So Andy, are you ready to go first in our presentation? Uh, sure, happy to. Thanks, John. Uh, let me share my screen. Brilliant. Uh, are you picking up um, my presentation? Yeah, we can see it. OK, it's not full screen yet, though. It's not full screen. Hopefully it should be. It's full screen on my screen. <laughs> mm, there's very little on our side. OK, hold on. Let me um, share again. Apologies. Thanks for your patience. All right. Um, so you should be seeing it now, hopefully. Unfortunately, it's still small. Really? Well, I don't know now what to do. Clean. There you go. Now it's clean. All right, no, no, it's just a little it's bit of a delay. Over okay. You. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much. Um, so my name is uh, Andy. 
<clears throat> Sorry, uh, my name is Andy Billich, and I work with uh, EarthSpark International uh, in, in Haiti. Um, and I'm going to share a little bit about our pilot project that we just completed with Mex and some of the learnings that um, we hope will be valuable for others, but have been very valuable for us in how we approach um, marketing uh, and talking with customers about the opportunity of electric uh, cooking. So I'll start real quick with a background on EarthSpark International. Um, currently, we operate two solar microgrids in southwestern Haiti, um, and we support about 725 customers, um, households, and businesses, um, and that's uh, over 3,700 people. Um, that Here's a picture here of our microgrid in Tiburon. Um, you can see uh, it's mostly solar, although we do have uh, backup generators for both our, our Les Anglais and Tiburon sites. Um, and this was primarily for um, energy access, just uh, access to electricity. But we had the fortunate opportunity over the last uh, year to work with the MEX program to bring electric cooking uh, to some of our customers for a pilot uh, project. And that's what I'm going to talk with you about today. Um, our study looked at 20 um, households that were connected to our microgrid in Les Anglais. Um, and then we also did eight customers who were connected to a, a solar home system uh, called uh, the Sunspot uh, electric cooking system. And all of our customers uh, were outfitted with both electric pressure cookers and electric induction stoves uh, and monitored over the course of a few months. Um, they, they still have their devices in place uh, now, but uh, the study itself went for um, three months last fall. Um, and we each of the devices had smart meters uh, attached to them. So we were able to get 15-minute um, interval uh, electric cooking data, and then we supported this with uh, a lot of surveys and a lot of conversations with our participants to kind of get a uh, overall view of uh, of the electric cooking experience. And um, some of the things that I'm going to share, uh, I'm trying to address the the questions that, that John has raised about how we were effective or how we could be more effective in marketing electric cooking, uh, which at the time was very, very new for um, the households in Les Anglais, um, and then how we think Think we can apply some of these lessons to our expansion plans in the future. So the biggest thing that we wanted to start with was um, what were some of the main concerns that participants had uh, for electric cooking? The biggest thing, um, uh, of course, uh, is cost. Um, while in our study, um, it was free to the participants, both the electricity for the fuel, uh, for the cooking, as well as the devices themselves, um, this won't be the case in, in the future, but we know that it will be the biggest concern just uh, from past experience with other projects, but also because because the highlighted benefit from our study, the biggest highlighted benefit from our study was the cost uh, savings compared to charcoal. So that's uh, first and foremost on people's minds. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about where the cost comparisons landed in, in a bit. But um, the second piece, um, our participants were very skeptical about the ability to cook traditional Haitian food um, with um, particularly the electric pressure cookers because it was so new compared to what they had used in the past. They were very nervous that it wasn't going to be able to cook things the way they like, uh, that it wasn't going to taste the way they wanted it to, or um, just something else was going to be going on. Um, so that's like a big um, awareness barrier to, to overcome kind of initially. The second thing that came through the, or the actual implementation of the project um, was the size of the device and the, the type of pots, particularly the ferromagnetic pots that were used for the induction stoves. Um, initial, our initial pilot had um, six quart pressure pressure cookers, which were found to be quite small for um, for the application. So it's a, it's a critical uh, learning for us to make sure that we have the right um, devices um, and pots selected for the participants because some of the feedback that we received uh, through the, the project was, yeah, this is great, but I, I really would like it to be bigger or I would like it uh, to be um, um, more suitable for like when I have lots of family over. So 
a lot of times the pressure cookers were, were good for the day to day, but like when you had bigger meals on Sundays or, or your neighbors coming over, you had to do um, two cycles through the electric pressure cooker, for example. Um, and then the last one was that there was this perception among our participants that electric cooking, particularly the electric pressure cooker, was going to be difficult. It was it was new. It was sort of this idea that wasn't really um, wasn't really natural um, to a lot of our participants. Um, and so this we found out a lot of this, obviously, through our initial conversations with the participants, but uh, also through uh, follow up throughout the study as to what they were thinking at the start versus what they are thinking now. Um, so from that uh, and from our, our study, the the key switching points, uh, like what what are customers going to decide to switch to electric cooking? Because the first most obvious one will be cost. If if we can have cost um, both for the fuel and for the device be approachable or comparable to um, charcoal, like it 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 become it um it enables um, customers to actually think about some of these other switching points. And so in our study, we found uh, an indicative willingness to pay across of our participants uh, just below our existing microgrid tariffs. But for many of our participants, about half of them, we found um, an indicative willingness to pay. And this is like um, the amount that they were saving on charcoal um, sort of uh, applied to an electricity um, cost. The, we found that the amount that they were willing to pay was above um, our microgrid tariffs, which suggests that there is a, a set of customers that we can target and we can work with um, that um, at least initially have um, this willingness to pay that's much higher than, than other customer sets. Obviously, this will change a little bit when we introduce a, a true price signal in the future, but it was exciting to see um, it be so close. Now, um, for the customers that aren't um, exactly on, on par and, and particularly um, to get the devices in place, we recognize the, the need for exploring things like results-based financing or climate finance or other sources of finance to help us get the devices in place for uh, the customers. Um, and that's, uh, something we don't have time to go fully into on, on this um, webinar, but uh, obviously something critically important that I'm looking forward to discussing a bit later. Um, from the customers themselves, the key benefits that they saw, they loved the time savings for uh, cooking. Um, a lot of the, the cooking dishes in Haiti are two to three hours um, of like pretty focused effort um, at the at the cooking and a lot of the meals were now being done in 20, 30 minutes. Uh, and so participants across the board were highlighting the time savings as a huge benefit, which means that it would be a key thing to market as a as a switching point for why we're going to electric cooking. And then the second part was the convenience. Um, participants were mentioning lack of smoke or excess heat, how easy it was to use. And the one that we found um, most uh, interesting that, that you'll hear a little bit from um, uh, some media in a little bit is um, that we had participants say that they love the ability to kind of turn on their pressure cooker, go to the market or go to church or go do whatever and come back and like the food wasn't uh, wasn't ruined. So this go and do other things ability um, that is enabled by the electric cooking was quite exciting for our participants. Um, real quick, I'll go into some promotion channels that we are that we currently used for this pilot and that we have will use in the future. The biggest one for us was um, we've been working with these communities and particularly our um, our director of community engagement, Wendy Sanasi. Uh, she has been working in these communities for five, six, seven years now, and it's uh, it's critical for establishing this uh, rapport uh, where participants were willing to trust us uh, on trying out these new devices because we have um, done good projects with them in the past. We've always been um, intentional in the way we communicate with our uh, communities, and our communities are very involved in the uh, governance of of our microgrids through uh, locally elected energy committees. So there's this trust in us that they that they didn't think we were trying to um, to rip them off or, or confuse them or anything. They, they trusted that we were trying to, to work to help them. Um, 
can't understate how critical that is for something like this, where you need to overcome that uh, awareness or skepticism barrier. Um, the uh, we also had some more paper um, based things in our in our in our stores and in um, in and around town. This is flyers, brochures, and recipe guides. Um, all of these were mostly created during this pilot project, but will be utilized going forward, um, particularly for helping um, participants once they have devices in place. Uh, this will be like safety guides and usage guides and recipe guides um, that will help people. Um, our pre-development surveys for developing new grids uh, have now integrated electric cooking type questions into them uh, so that we can get an understanding of which customers in our new towns might be good targets for electric cooking. And then the two that I'm gonna focus on uh, here to end my um, conversation is uh, Cuisson Electrique, which is a social media platform that we launched as a result of our pilot study. Uh, and then the power of, uh, of just hearing from our own um, customers, their own experiences and how that has been effective in driving other interest. So the first is Cuisson Electric. Um, you can see the um, social media channels there at the bottom. Uh, it's basically just a, a platform where we're sharing stories from our, our grid and from uh, our um, participants, uh, recipes and news and profiles, uh, as well as some uh, video footage, which you'll see in a second. Um, and it's not only our communities um, that we're working in, but also just the broader um, uh, set of people interested in electric cooking and interested in Haitian uh, food culture, Haitian cooking. So we've engaged a lot of diaspora com communities uh, and are going to continue to grow that more uh, as a as a channel for for sharing as a, and as a channel for learning about the opportunity that electric cooking um, presents. And then the biggest one, as I said, is, uh, is sort of word of mouth. Uh, we had, uh, these are uh, photos from some of our participants and really where we were getting the most uh, interest in both our existing communities as well as other communities that, that we went to for um, pre-development surveying was like, because they had heard uh, from, from folks in Les Anglais that they were doing this electric cooking, that they were really excited about it, that it was working. Um, so we recognize obviously the, the, the power that some of these voices have had, and we um, we will continue to like um, try to highlight them as um, like you no, know, see, this isn't just a pie in the sky thing. This is working for real Haitian families. Um, and one way that we are doing that is through some video promotions and outreach. Um, this here is the English version of what is normally a Creole uh, video um, that gets shared on our Facebook and on on our uh, Instagram and that we will be using for marketing for when we have community meetings in, in the future for uh, for new deployments of electric cooking. Um, and so hopefully this will come through for y'all, but this uh, is kind of just the first in a series of videos that we're producing um, that sort of, sort of elevate the participant voices um, to, to describe the electric cooking context in Haiti. <laughs>
Uh, hopefully that um, came through all right, um, but that's just an example of where we are going uh, for our um, for our, uh, for our marketing videos. Uh, excuse me, uh, and we're going to be working to integrate electric cooking a little bit more into our scale up. Uh, we're planning for over fifteen hundred households over the next five years um, as part of our expansion project with the Green Climate Fund. Now electric cooking is a core component of that, and we're looking forward to sort of refining this social marketing and, and outreach and, and learning from other folks in the field as, as we move forward uh, in this space and create new opportunities for both uh, ourselves as operators, but also for our communities for better improved livelihoods um, um, and, and some of the other benefits that, uh, that John mentioned. Um, so with that, that, um, that's what I have for you all. And I'm very much looking forward to uh, questions and uh, conversing in the chat and then also uh, offline as well. Thank you so much for the time. Brilliant, thank you, Andy. The video came through okay, but it was a little bit jerky. I wonder if you could put the link to the, the video in, in the chat and people could maybe um, have a click through afterwards and, and, and have a, a watch um, more smoothly and, and share with colleagues as well. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. We'll post it on the Cuisson Electric page, and I'll and I'll share it uh, with uh, the Mex team uh, as well. It is not fully uh, live online just yet. <laughs> ah, okay. So the sneak preview. Sneak preview. <laughs> Great. Um, well, yeah, I really like what you were saying about the the Village Energy Committee and and the need to develop trust with with local communities in order to effectively implement these kind of solutions. I think it really highlights the, the opportunity for um, supplying electric appliances through mini grid developers because you have that level of knowledge, that deep relationship with your customers that really there's very few other organizations that, that already have those kind of existing ties. So the, the motivation for, for selling these appliances is, is, is not purely to make a profit on the appliances, it's really to to be able to sell more electricity units, uh, to make a profit on the electricity itself, as well as the commitment to um, improving quality of life for, for your customers. And in order to do that, you really need to understand those customers, what their needs and their aspirations are. So for me, that's one, one of the main reasons why electric cooking on mini grids in particular is, is a really exciting opportunity. So I've seen a couple of questions come in on, on the chat, which are specific about this presentation. So I'm, I'm just going to ask these up now. Um, if there's any other questions for Andy specifically, please do put them into the chat. Um, if there's questions in general, then then also into the chat and we'll come back to them at the end. So Karen had a very specific question around the induction stove. Um, did you import them? Um, she asked if she had finding affordable induction stoves for uh, doing in Guatemala. Yeah, we we had to uh, we had to import them. Uh, the market in Haiti, there is one in Port-au-Prince, but it is extremely expensive and hard to track down at um, the quantities that we needed. So we we imported from the U.S. and I can I can share with you, Karen, if you uh, uh, email me, I can share with you what where we have found some cheaper units. They're they're not terribly uh, cheap and that's why uh, it'll be really important for uh, results-based financing or other sources to, to help get them in place. But we think that we can leverage the like logistics channels that we have through being a, a larger mini grid operator to help get those in place rather than have um, customers individually try to source them. But thank you for the Absolutely. question. <laughs> So we've got two questions from Martin. Martin is asking whether rice cookers were also included in the study alongside induction stoves and electric pressure cookers. And his second question is, 
around what you see as the longer term business opportunities that derive from, from this pilot, given that in this particular study, the appliances and the electricity were provided for, for free? Yeah, it's a great question, Martin. Thank you. Um, we did not include rice cookers uh, initially, but we are looking um, at them in the future. Um, obviously, lower power draw for some of the same output that uh, what our EPCs were used for. Uh, a lot of times the EPCs were used for legumes and rice, which, which can be done effectively on a rice cooker for uh, less power draw, which um, is very important in the mini grid context. To your second question, we, we really view uh, electric cooking as this energy dense uh, transferable load that allows us to have a very high um, high volume of consumption when it is sunny out for example um, in Haiti the um, cooking profiles are such that most of the cooking happens between 11 and 2 um, and, and which aligns very very well with solar production and so what this allows us to do is it allows us to build more robust systems for our mini grid so better battery capacity and like broader broader uh, systems that are mostly going to be recovered through other electricity use, but the um, the electric cooking really enables this uh, additional um, like load to soak up in the middle of the day, which is an additional revenue stream to support it. Um, and we really view this as a way to um, design better systems and still help on the recovery side of things. Ultimately, we need to be putting in tariffs that will help that. Um, but to, to us, the real value is in um, the actual planning uh, and operation of the grids, particularly because we can now like defer, if we know that a storm, for example, is coming the next day and we'll have low solar production, we can um, curtail the electric cooking, like obviously signaling our customers a day in advance um, so that we are still able to get the benefits on the, on the sunny days without breaking our batteries or breaking our grids on the, uh, on the um, off days and that, initially means that we are targeting reducing about 70% of um, people's charcoal and wood fuel consumption. So not, not a full switch initially, um, but hoping to move to a full switch, obviously, uh, over time as we, uh, we work to refine the business model a little bit more. Um, but the business model itself will be a combination of um, enabling us to Build more in uh, uh, more improved systems, uh, collecting revenue from the electricity sales, um, incentive-based uh, payments, particularly uh, if we're able to connect this to results-based uh, financing for operators that either. Um, there's programs like this, obviously, in Africa. We're hoping to get some active in Haiti and show show that um, show that gap need um, here. Um, but I think the combination of those um, helps to make it an attractive solution on the business side. And then just on the service side, we are in the business of energy access and, and um, providing like this. Uh, this service to our communities to hopefully be improving livelihoods um, and 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 socioeconomic development. So as a service as a service model side of the business model, um, we're excited about electric cooking for that reason too. Fantastic! Many many reasons to be excited about electric cooking. Um, one final question, and in the interest of time, we're going to have to move on to the next presenter. So Nigel Monk is asking. In the video, there was a lady who said that there was no smoky taste with a giggle. So he was wondering, was she implying that that is a good thing or a bad thing? I think previously we've often assumed that people always want a smoky flavor, but much of our research now has suggested that it depends upon the food, it depends upon the context. So in this yeah. context, it's uh, it's it's a, a very astute question, Nigel. She, <laughs> um, her interview footage was fun to edit because every question had a giggle <laughs> in it. Um, so that it wasn't belying anything on the smoky. She um, in particular did not like the smoky taste. So she was actually really excited about it not having a smoky taste. Most of our participants, however, do like that smoky uh, taste. Um, although it wasn't really um, highlighted as a drawback uh, in any of the interviews that we had with folks. It was highlighted as something um, 
before the study started. So I do think it is a, a concern and, and something that can come through maybe in the induction stoves a little bit more because we do have folks that say they like the smoky taste more, but it wasn't it wasn't um, maybe as much as it has been in other research for MEX, where it actually has been a drawback noted by participants. Um, we didn't have anybody say it as a as a drawback, although it was noted as something uh, that they were interested or concerned about um, before the study started. Yeah, I guess the question is, do they like it enough to spend uh, 10 to 15 minutes lighting the charcoal stove and, and paying additional money and cooking more slowly and having to watch the pot every single day, or are they happy to have a smoky flavor occasionally? Yeah, and it seems like in 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 Haiti, at least with our participants, the the bigger concern was on was on cost and convenience rather than the smoky taste. Um, all of the participants said that they were able to cook the Haitian food that they wanted to cook on the uh, on the electric um, devices, which um, I, I understand is different than some of the other uh, research in other markets. Um, but it was an interesting finding for us to see in ours. But thank you for the question. Great. Thanks, Andy. And thank you to our um, guests who, who commented. So I would like to invite you to, to continue posting questions in the question, uh, sorry, in the chat. Um, for now, we're going to have to move on to the next presenter. So Rocio, can I hand over to you? And I think Nick yep. is going to show the, the slides from, from now okay. on. Okay. Okay. Nick, slides. Are you able uh, to share your screen, Nick? Great, thanks. thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll um, introduce myself. Thanks, Nick. Um, I'm Rocio. I'm one of the two co-founders of Vida Sasa uh, in Kenya. It's a last mile and finance distribution company based in Kenya and um, very recently also in Uganda. Um, and we are dedicated to uh, make a series of household goods or technologies more affordable and more accessible, specifically in rural areas. Next slide, thanks, Nick. So very roughly, uh, yeah, thanks. Where we are, what we do and why we exist, um, and what we do really is uh, we are trying to distribute uh, technologies or innovations or, or, or products that uh, improve the quality of life of rural families. Um, in Kenya, Uganda, and hopefully in the in the long run in East Africa, what we are really good at, or believe we believe that we are really good at, is at acquiring uh, clients in rural areas. So we are exclusively working in the rural areas um, in Kenya and Uganda. We also have to offer, and this is something that we have to, we offer credit to all uh, the unbanked, even if you don't have credit histories, irrespective of your income. Uh, to make these goods more affordable because uh, inevitable they are way too expensive. Um, and we want to be there, we want to be the platform where people can think, oh, I really need to upgrade my life, uh, who do I go to? Uh, and they will come to Vida Sasa. By the way, Vida Sasa means products now. Um, it's all about I get in now and I pay uh, over time. Next slide. Um, we've been operating since 2015. In, uh, in Western Kenya mostly, and a few months in Uganda, we specialize on uh, reaching our rural women um, specifically. So the vast majority of our clients are rural women, and we have a portfolio of products that are relevant to them in the house and outside the house, because obviously as we are in rural areas, the vast majority, oh yeah, the vast majority of our clients are farmers. Um, so we get we get these products to them. We make them. Yeah, that's fine. We can stay here if you if you like. It's, it's fine. We we have a, a series of products that ranges from uh, anything that I need to cook, um, lighting, um, small solar home systems, uh, and agricultural products. Uh, because the women are in charge of all of the above, as you as you can imagine, um, and we make them. Uh, we create the awareness and I explain how we make this product more accessible uh, by going to them. And we also make them more affordable by uh, offering credit to all. 
and and I'll explain exactly how how we work because this is very really, really relevant for the EPCs, but in general for any new innovation that um, needs to be uh, promoted in in emerging markets or new markets. So maybe next slide. Um, so so far so good. I think I haven't really said anything that you were not aware of. Uh, but maybe I'll narrow down on how we operate uh, on the ground in uh, the Bida Sasa model. Um, the core of what we do is leveraging women's social capital, um, and by this um, I mean several things at the same time. Um, at the very least, there are two uh, very important ingredients in our model that does does this leveraging. The, the women in the rural areas, they tend to be kind of neglected. They have lower access to products and services, including financial services and so on and so on, because, you know, these, uh, apart from prejudices, they tend to have low income, they have less education or less access to information, they have less mobility, la, 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 la. And we, we all know that, right? We know, all know that there is a strong gender element here when, when we are talking about uh, adoption of innovation. Um, but it has been solved in the past. Um, and one of the systems, one of the models that does work is don't, don't expect them to come to you, but go to them, uh, like the Tupperware model, where everything happens in people's homes. And the, the, the model, the business model, uses the relationships with the clients and leverages those relationships and creates this snowball effect where people, through word of mouth, will almost buy for free um, promote your product. And that's, what, that's exactly what we are trying to do in, you, in, in Kenya and in Uganda. And we are using that uh, word of mouth effect for two main reasons. Uh, the obvious one is the marketing. Right? If you if you have a the best way to market a product is having a happy client that will do it for you for free. They are so happy they will share with all your friends. So we effectively um, are using uh, uh, we are incorporating these special clients, which we call them leaders, by the way, into our marketing strategy. And we really look after them uh, because they are the ones doing most of the work to acquire, acquire new clients. Uh, the second way we are leveraging social capital is for the credit element. Um, we cannot do, and nobody can do because it's too cost, uh, cost, costly, uh, do traditional credit checks for loans that are below $100. Uh, and in soon the products that we are selling range between uh, $50 and $120. So it doesn't really make any sense to go to the traditional finance model. So we are using um, an alternative model, which is called group liability, whereby all the members in the group, um, theoretically, they trust each other and they are liable with each other and cross-guarantee cross each other. And this is, a, this is a model that has been used for decades already, especially in um, uh, India and Bangladesh. And, and within uh, East African societies, especially with women, is a relatively well-known model that already exists. So all we are doing is by piggybacking on something that is already well understood from a social point, social point of view. So we are using this group model for everything. We give uh, loans, effectively, we are selling these products on loans with payment plans to groups of people. Um, and a leader of the group is the person who will be doing the client acquisition, finding my friends, showing the product, uh, hey, um, you know, you have opportunity now to buy this new stuff, it's amazing. Um, I have a sample at home, why don't you come to my home um, and I'll show you how it works. So the leaders will do all the awareness and the marketing and they will also manage the groups um, along the uh, duration of the loan, obviously, because the, uh, selling on credit is relatively easy. Uh, if you are saying to them, hey, you only have to pay $5 up front and you get your new stove, uh, there's a queue of people. <laughs> the problem is selling to the right person and making sure that they get paid back. So that's that's an additional bottleneck, an additional burden that we have in our business model. So the leader's uh, role is extremely important for us because they help us to acquire their customers, to create awareness, to do the marketing and to also make sure that the people that join the group are trustworthy and can't afford to make the installments. Um, and that's the core of what we do. So maybe I'll talk a little bit about the EPC, 
The EPC is just like any other the products that we are selling. And obviously, as we are, sell, are serving mostly women, uh, cooking needs come top of the priority list. Um, and we are, do, we are selling EPCs uh, alongside uh, LPG and efficient cookstoves. Um, yeah, maybe we go to the next slide and I'll tell you the story about the EPCs. So we, we started with this product because of the um, uh, uh, MEX project that we uh, ran early 2020. And that's when we did a first study on potential uh, usefulness of EPC in rural areas. Obviously the main drawback and the main uh, barrier of EPCs in rural areas is the low electrification rates um, in many parts of the world. Um, Kenya is not bad. It has improved massively, uh, officially and non-officially. Uh, we also have measured these ourselves, um, more or less. The uh, electrification rates in the rural areas, they are not 5% anymore. And, um, and I think it's, it's going in the right direction. And even if it's today, is this is a product that is still marginal because not many people have electricity at home, um, there will be a point in time where electri electrification in one shape or an another, be it solar, be it microgrids, mini grids, or the grid, will be there. Uh, we have measured this um, with our own kind of uh, surveys in, in, our, in our areas, more or less 30% of the responders said that they had electricity, so it's not too bad. And this is in line with uh, official data. Um, so what we did early 2020, uh, we ran the MEX project and we started selling um, because we are, that's what we do, we, we sell products. And we sell this product like any other, the pro any other products with um, the group model, with leaders involvement and with a payment plan attached to each of the, um, each of the units that um, are bought by the clients. Um, so far, we have sold uh, around 300 units. So this is very, very small. Uh, we have been holding back ourselves. We are only promoting this product in a few of our branches that have the highest electrification rate. While we are holding back, because we still have problems with securing the stock in country. Uh, we don't import ourselves. We uh, rely on existing importers. Um, as these products are inevitably um, manufactured in China, um, and this is not our expertise, uh, we, and this is not just CPC, but uh, lots of the products we sell, we need to have good partnerships in place from people that are specialists on uh, either manufacturing or importing the right goods for us, um, and then we will buy in country. So we kind of have been holding back, um, and that's why, 300 units for us is, is not really where we want to be, but uh, it's a chicken and egg problem. If you cannot secure the partnership on the importing side, what's the point of promoting a new product? Worst case scenario, you end up uh, creating a lot of uh, enthusiasm and buzz, and you disappoint your clients because you don't have stock. So it's, it's, a, it's a balance now that we, we are a bit stuck there. Um, of the 300 units, overwhelmingly, everybody that signed the contract, i.e., the uh, client uh, are women, and they tend to be, you know, middle-aged women um, in rural areas that have electricity in this case, but they are not really your sophisticated urbanite lady that will be checking, um, you know, YouTube videos. So I, I want to make clear that um, this is rural Kenya, and social media is pretty much irrelevant in in this um, context. We chose um, a mechanical dye model. Uh, we are still not clear about this, this, um, this choice. One, because it's cheaper, and two, because we think it's more intuitive, intuitive to use. Um, the electronic parts that we tested in the, the different brands available in Kenya, we find it a little bit complicated. Um, we still have problems with what do we do with the language if it's written in English and people don't speak English, what's the point? And so on. So we still have problems with the design and the user interface that we haven't really solved. Um, and as we are not manufacturers, we, we depend a lot on the manufacturers doing a little bit more work on the uh, user experience, um, especially on the, on the interface, uh, on the electric part. 
um, and also the electric passing to be more expensive models. Um, and word of mouth. So word of mouth is what works in rural areas. Um, as I was saying, the leader plays an extremely important role here. They would demonstrate their products. They will explain how things work. Um, and people will learn orally how to use this product. And this is very important in our, in our context. We try to avoid any printing material because we know people are not going to read it. There's a high chance first that they are, they are not even able to read. Second, it may be in the wrong language. Um, and third, that piece of paper will get lost after a week or two. So uh, we have to create a model that includes the cultural, you know, the, the, the way information is, is, is transferred, at least in rural Kenya, is orally. Um, so that's why we need to have very good relationship with these leaders, look after them year over year, even if, the, even if they go silent for six months and they are not active, um, so we can make sure that they are well-trained, well-tooled, that they keep doing that word of mouth and that creation of awareness and eventually doing demonstrations at home if they really like the technology. Um, maybe some learnings just to conclude. Um, the, uh, obviously, we are taking a risk that we don't get paid um, because it's an expensive product um, and uh, we have a relatively long uh, payment plan. In this case, it's nine months. So far, so good. The repayments have been uh, good, even a little bit better than the average uh, compared to other products. Clients are very satisfied, and I'm, I'm not going to go in through the uh, benefits because we, we already know what these benefits are. Um, positive cell electrification rates are increasing, so we are in the right direction. Initially, people were worried about, oh, is this going to increase my electricity bill? Uh, and it happened, it is not true. Uh, people have been able to measure the consumption themselves, and, and, and that's something which is very positive because if your neighbor says, hey, this is great, and it doesn't really add to your electricity bill that much, um, you know, I, that's the best thing they can say. On the negatives, the importer, we have had stockouts. <laughs> they don't have parts. They are not really interested in this product, which is uh, marginal for them. Uh, the famous uh, demand from clients, which is why can't I have a second pot? Because with one pot, my life is more complicated. If I had a second one, it would be easier to cook and so on and so on. So I think many of you know, uh, have experienced this already, so I won't go into much detail about that. But yeah, there's a lot of work to do yet on, on partnerships. And, and the price, 9,000 shilling is equivalent to $90, even when you divide by nine, is a lot of money for most people in rural areas. So uh, the, price, the price is not there. I think it's still expensive. And obviously the big thing is, um, if this is a product that needs, that needs to compete with existing cooking solutions, i.e. LPG and a fancy charcoal stove, the price needs to come down. It needs to come down to 5,000 or 6,000 shillings, which is 50 or $60, which in Kenya is what will you be spending in, um, in an LPG or a fancy charcoal stove. Um, so we are not yet there. Uh, we, we still don't know what to do with um, recipe books and how to share timings and, and recipes. Um, and the education part, we are still going round in circles about, do we even bother printing it? If anybody has a pictorial recipe book that doesn't include any words, <laughs> no language, or very, very simple words, I would love to see it because we, we have not really been able to design something that works, uh, that is kind of language agnostic and anybody can understand um, with, with pictures. And we still don't know about the digital part versus the mechanical dial. It's, it's something that we are still hesitating um, uh, when we really do not have a solution for that. Um, and I think I'll stop there. Um, I'm happy to take pictures, uh, so questions. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope this helps to understand a little, another experience of EPCs in the real world. Back to you, John. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you, yeah. Um, just to answer some of the, the questions that you posed around the, 
the kind of availability of electric pressure cookers that are tailored to the, the local context, in particular with um, local languages and pictorial manuals. And I'm not sure if you're aware about the recent publication of the usability testing bias yeah. guide for the Global Leap competition. Yeah. You are? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So I've, I've seen it, I've seen it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. I'll post in the chat in case anyone else that's on the call is interested in having a look. Basically, we we got um, a number of different models of electric pressure cookers and tested them with everyday cooks in Nairobi and Kenya to find out which ones best match their needs and aspirations. And the winner of the best value prize uh, was Burn Manufacturing's electric pressure cooker, which has um, buttons with local food written in Swahili and a largely pictorial um selection of menus in in the um user manual uh for recipes for cooking local foods so let me put that in the chat there whilst i do that then um we have a clarification um from from karen um who is is saying that she's uncomfortable with the idea of purposefully using women in communities to market your products for free i i didn't think that was the case could you clarify whether the leaders are, are sales agents, so they're paid, or whether they are actually used, used yeah. for free? It's, it's for free. I'm, I'm exaggerating. It's almost for free. Um, what, what naturally happens when, and I think happens to all of us, how, how do you choose your restaurant? How do you choose the hotel when you go on holiday? You ask your friends, right? This has always happened. This is, the, this is social networking. Uh, this is the non-Facebook social networking that also happens in rural Kenya, as you can imagine. So all of us are doing publicity for free when we like something. Um, so we are leveraging on that. If we say if we find somebody who loves, you know, falls in love with the technology, your I don't know your iPhone user, iPhone number version one user was the one that was making all the publicity for free for you on behalf of you. So this is kind of the same thing because these these ladies, these these leaders, they are the early adopters. They really risk takers. They love the technology, and and in exchange, obviously, of support from our side, they will jump to the opportunity to promote this product. First of all, because they love the product, and second, because we are with them. Uh, they are paid, right? However, and I want to make it very clear, they are not agents. They are paid because they do this work for us. They get cash incentives. We call them cash incentives rather than commissions. Um, they get also gifts. They get training. They get tools. Um, and uh, the gifts are branded so they can wear a T-shirt, blah, 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 blah. Um, their motivation to do this work is different from a commission-based agent. They are not necessarily doing it because of the money. Obviously, the money makes sense to them because it's another source of income in their already complicated lives. But I have to stress they are not agents because an agent normally takes certain level of risk. An agent will have to buy a good, have carry the basket of goods door by door or go to the market and resell it. These ladies are not taking any risk. There is no obligation for them there's to to uh, dedicate a certain number of hours for us. They don't have any targets. They don't have any obligation towards us. If they love the product, they will naturally find people like themselves that will also love the product. And they're really happy to uh, find those people and make sure that they qualify and they have enough income to meet the repayments. Um, and in exchange of that, obviously they get some money. But the motivation of doing this, apart from the money and the gifts, is social capital. This is a, this is a like a, a virtual circle of social capital. I'm a leader in my community. I know lots of people. I love this technology. I'm going to promote it because now I become the expert on EPCs or gas or lighting or whatever in my community. Therefore, my social capital increases. Right. So it's, it's going round in circles because they already are well connected, they expand their networks and they become even more famous. And that's one of the main motivations why people become a leader. And they need to have a spare time, right? A person with a full-time job um, that doesn't have a spare time will not volunteer to become a leader. But as we are dealing in rural areas, most people are smallholder farmers by definition. And by definition, they have multiple jobs. They work the land, 
they sell some produce in the market, they, I don't know, do this, they do that, uh, they do braiding, they sell a little bit of milk, and promoting these products alongside the multiple jobs that they already have is not such a burden for them. It kind of fits really well in the complicated lives that they already have. Thanks for that clarification. I think there's quite a few questions that have popped up on the chat, but in the interest of time, unfortunately, we're going to have to move on to the, to the next presenter. So hopefully we can come back to some of them at the end. Um, so Amai, I think you are up next. Can, can we hand over to you? And Nick, if you could switch over the presentation. Certainly, will do. Uh, I ought to have seen this coming, wouldn't I? <laughs> Okay, it's, uh, it's got it open and now I will share my screen. I'll never get a job doing this. Okay, can you see the slides? We can, yeah, over to you, am I? Great. Great, thanks John, thanks Nick. Hi everyone, my name is Amai. I am from the ID Innovation Lab and today I'll provide a very quick glimpse of some of the marketing approaches that we've applied for the electric cooking sales uh, that we've been doing over the last year. I'll just uh, say that this will be quite high level. So feel free to ask questions or at the end, email me to find out more about ID's clean cooking work. Next slide. So super quick introduction to the ID Innovation Lab since 2010. The lab has been championing human-centered design, uh, innovation through researching needs, designing products and services, uh, embedding beha behavior change strategies uh, for uh, ID's customers. And, uh, and we apply these methods for agriculture, wash, clean water, nutrition, uh, next slide is fine, Nick. Uh, and more recently, we've been working in clean cooking. So our, our work in clean cooking started with MEX and began with conducting foundational research, so MEX TRID, to understand the current barriers to, uh, for customers to adopt cleaner cooking solutions. Uh, as part of MEX TRID, we've uncovered a number of barriers. Uh, more detail can be uh, found in our report on the MEX website. Uh, but findings also show that uh, there is a potential for a range of new electric cooking solutions to enter the market. And just if we make the technology accessible, there's a growing number of customers who are willing to make a switch to cleaner cooking solutions. And that's where uh, our work uh, with the market-based pilots uh, started with Mexico. Next slide. So with Mexico, the goal was to iteratively pilot test solutions and strategies that could trigger uh, market demand in Cambodia. And broadly, we wanted to test uh, sales of electric cooking devices. So without any subsidy mechanisms, try to test different sales approaches, um, inform energy use perceptions through bundling an energy meter so people can actually see how much energy is consumed and kind of get reassured about uh, their costs, their cooking costs. And lastly, embedding behavior change strategies within our marketing to increase the adoption of electric cooking. Next slide. So I'll briefly talk about two examples of approaches we tried during our tests, but also caveat these findings with the fact that this is based only on six months worth of testing experience. So um, we fully acknowledge that we are not the experts yet, but rather testing our way iteratively towards finding the right balance of solutions. So over six months, we made iterative adjustments to different levers of what we call the marketing mix. So making adjustments to the pricing, uh, the communication materials, to the different messages. And the two key examples that 
I'll talk about today are the direct sales approach. So trying to bring solutions closer to people's homes and having conversations with customers in their homes. And secondly, community cooking events. Next slide. Next slide. And again. The previous one, sorry, not this one, Nick. I think there was a lag. Oh, I see. You want to go back? Back again? There's there's a bit of a lag, Nick. Um, could you right. go to the slide six, which says identifying oh cooking problems? This one. Oh, is it build? No. So I'm seeing the slide identifying cooking problems. Hopefully, everyone else is as well. Yeah, that's the one I see too. Okay, I think okay. there's a okay. bit of a bit of a lag on my end. Ah, right. Yeah, nice. this one, I see it. Great. So we bringing solutions to people, people's homes, we attempted to model uh, an approach uh, that uh, that aims to directly engage in the conversation with customers around the key problems and impacts So problems being the health time, cost, convenience uh, of their current cooking methods. And if we allow people, so we've observed that if we allow people to identify with the problems they're currently facing and help make connections to the impacts of these problems on their lives, there's not a real need to sell the solutions to customers. So, and through that conversation, the choice of adopting something cleaner, safer, becomes clearer for customers. So we trained our sales team with a sales script. So as you can see in the photo, they use a site seller or a flip book to give a presentation to the customers, which allows them to build a conversation um, by asking how they cook their food, how much time it took, um, are there any frustrations, calculating um, the cost of cooking associated with previous or uh, current cooking methods. And only when that conversation is built and they understand the customer's cooking needs, they pitch the right solutions and they recommend the right solutions. And the attempt is to always to target women cooks and to recommend solutions that match their needs. Next slide. So during the pilot, yeah, this is the one. So during the pilot, we, we also realized that our sales pitches were taking too long and creating fatigue for not just our customers, but also our sales agents. So customers mentioned that they wanted to see the products in action first, but at the same time, it was also not possible to physically carry an EPC or a electric stove from door to door. So we produce videos to help customers understand the experience better and we also put these up on our Facebook page. So customers and non-customers could learn more about our brand and products. And we, we observed that videos are a really, really useful uh, tool for complex decision-making inside a household where just by being able to view the video later after the sales agent has left, an entire family can weigh in on the choice of the new cooking appliance and really understand how it works, uh, you know, how it actually fits within the household and whether or not this matches their needs. So more than an image or a catalog or even the site seller, a video that clearly shows the product uh, 
and the benefits that can be viewed by the cook and their family guides that decision making and has a lot of value. Next slide. I think again, apologies, there's some sort of a lag at my end. It's, this, it's visible here, so you can maybe start talking community cooking events. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. great. So um, community cooking. Um, yeah, so even if we guarantee that there will be a demonstration after customers make the purchase, a number of customers aren't simply satisfied with the sales pitch or video, and a common follow-up for interested potential customers who are convinced with the benefits would be that this product sounds amazing, but I'd like to see it in action. So our sales agents would shortlist all interested customers, book appointments for a date, and give group demos and kind of, uh, you know, uh, turn the product on, boil some water or, you know, cook something. But through that process, we sort of organically realized that we also need to start doing cooking demonstrations. And that's how we started to set up live events um, and to really help demonstrate the fit with the cooking culture, showing how, I guess, showing how new foods can be cooked uh, is quite important because mostly customers' menus tend to be standard and a couple new dishes and uh, and menus and recipes uh, for these uh, new dishes can trigger interest to purchase. So as you can see in this photo, uh, people love cooking events where they can themselves cook, interact, um, and experience cooking in a totally different way. And that generates a lot of excitement about the new solutions. And this also helps to do away with the perception that a modern electric device is exclusively for Western food and it's not really suitable for our cooking culture. So showing customers that it actually is super convenient, you know, press a, press a button, turn it on, you can start cooking uh, and doesn't require a massive change in the cooking tradition is quite key. Um, we didn't unfortunately get to test too many of these events, but this will be our priority uh, in as we move forward. So we'll be continuing our sales and market testing activities until uh, mid next year. So we will continue to build on the community cooking events, uh, COVID pending, of course, but initial signs of these events have been positive and people uh, had, you know, loved the interactive aspect of it. And um, next slide. So lastly, I wanted to share one of the key insights uh, and highlight the value of data-driven decision-making uh, because early on we had the hypothesis that if people were aware of the negative impacts of the smoke and the unreliability and, uh, of LPG, customers would be more inclined to switching to modern solutions. And we also assume that messaging on aspirational modern devices uh, could boost customer interest. Um, but contrary to our hypothesis, data indicated that neither aspirations nor health benefits related to smoke uh, or smoke-free cooking were a deciding factor behind people's purchasing decisions. In fact, people valued more safety, convenience, and time-saving, as you can see in the graph with uh, Safety being 84% of our customers, uh, convenience and time saving similarly very high as the biggest factors responsible for triggering their interest to purchasing uh, electric cooking solutions. So there's some, local, some Cambodia specific research that shows that uh, cleaner forms of cooking can free up uh, about 25 hours uh, per month of the cook's time, allowing for focusing on other income generating activities. So this data served as a useful basis for us to refine our value proposition, um, 
simplify our messaging and pitch to our customers iteratively accordingly. So I'll, I'll leave the findings at that. And, uh, and, and yeah, thank you very much. Fantastic, thank you, Amai. And it's always a pleasure to, to hear from you and, and the insights that you've got. And it's so great that some, many of the, the findings that you've got reflect so closely what we've, we've found in, in East Africa as well. Um, I would love to ask you lots of questions um, but in the interest of time, I think we're going to have to move directly on to our final presenter. So, Vishika, over to you. And, and Nick, again, if you could switch up the slides for us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nick. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Thank you. Um, so, uh, good evening, everyone, and this is evening in India. So, and uh, <laughs> and uh, it's uh, it was wonderful to listen to all the speakers. And here are some insights from uh, uh, our work so far. Uh, so, uh, Urja Box aims uh, to uh, promote clean cooking, which includes all forms of clean cooking, and we aspire that every household whether it is rural or urban should be able to use at least one renewable energy based device uh, for cooking uh, we necessarily do not bifurcate as uh, rural and urban uh, households or uh, that because uh, it is well connected in a way that if urban uh, households use a majority uh, cooking fuel, then that is easy for the rural households to replicate. So that so promoting clean cooking in rural uh, urban areas also helps uh, for increasing the adoption in rural areas. That is one of our findings from various surveys. Uh, so uh, we have uh, three basic services. One is the clean cooking demonstration okay. stations that we set up. Then we have the promoting uh, clean cooking devices as livelihood services and setting up clean cook stove shops. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, so how we have arrived at uh, our solutions is something that we'll cover in the next couple of slides. Uh, so we interacted with a lot of people through uh, online surveys, uh, through uh, video interviews and in-person interviews, uh, especially uh, with rural and urban, uh, both uh, demographics. And uh, when we were trying to introduce, uh, say, something a very new device like an EPC uh, or an induction cook stove uh, or maybe even a hot plate, uh, people had apprehensions uh, about uh, whether they would be able to use their existing utensils uh, for cooking in these uh, using these new devices or not. Uh, secondly, uh, they were very much concerned about the repair and maintenance, uh, which should be accessible and affordable. So they had concerns that now it will work fine, say for a year or two, but if it uh, develops any major uh, fault, uh, operational fault, then whether, then whether that help will be accessible to us or not and whether it would be affordable or not. So if we are spending on one device, say, uh, uh, 5,000 rupees, uh, Indian rupees, which nearly converts to around, say, uh, I don't know how much it would be in pounds, it would be around four... 80 pounds maybe so if you are if you are just spending that much of amount on uh, one cooking device if it does not operate properly in the next couple of years will we have to throw that device away or whether we can repair it and if the repair and maintenance it is not accessible in our vicinity then we would not like to use it next is the uh, they uh, were also trying to find out incentives and services uh, which were available uh, that come along with the device. So there are uh, many uh, financing models that can work as incentives uh, for uh, uh, facilitating this adoption and uh, also uh, incentives in terms of uh, you know, getting some accessories free with the devices. So here in uh, India, government of India tried to 
There's some background noise. I don't know. Yeah, sorry, if I could just ask everyone to mute their microphones. Yeah. Sorry. So in go uh, here, the government of India piloted uh, electric cooking projects of the uh, by trying to sell induction cook stoves uh, to a, a couple of villages. Uh, so the uh, so the main apprehension that the people had was that their existing cooking utensils could not be used on uh, on the induction cook stoves. That was one. Uh, second was. Uh, they had electricity available, but it was intermittent. So though the device is reliable, the fuel is not reliable to them. So uh, that was another thing that was worrying them. And most households who have an LPG connection, due to the cost of that, they are using it very sparingly. And water heating is one major application where uh, they want to use just firewood. So uh, cooking basically uh, is kind of divided into two uh, uh, sections, I would say. One is cooking where people are actually cooking the food and one is the water heating application. So even if they want to use uh, a fire, uh, improved devices for cooking, they will still use the firewood for uh, water heating applications. So that is something which uh, needs to be addressed if we want to address the clean cooking uh, aspect in a holistic way, because as long as they have the access to the uh, firewood and uh, uh, the fire open firewood uh, chula as they call here they will definitely uh, use it for that will be their first choice of uh, uh, cook stove that is what our uh, interactions have shown so far the challenges again from the cooking perspective are very rigid cooking styles so uh, our demonstrations are helping uh, to change uh, that but it is extremely difficult uh, because at least in India every state has a different cooking style so uh, changing according to that is kind of uh, challenging uh, people do not trust the technology immediately so that does take a lot of time and uncertainty about the cost and fuel supply so uh, that definitely is there because they are already using everything that is free. So you're actually going to compete against something that is freely available to them. So uh, where few people who have access to some funds are the early adopters and then perhaps some financial in incentives and some innovative models are required for others to get motivated to use this and uh, the last challenges uh, challenge which we faced mainly was the uh, change in diet so uh, they are worried that for uh, you know they'll have to start cooking dishes that will suit the cooking devices not what their original diet is so only demonstrations i believe is the uh, right way to inspire them or to address all of these uh, issues. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, what we have realized, I mean, this is not something very new that I'm presenting, but fuel stacking is uh, is very, very dominant in uh, India, and it happens in rural and urban uh, areas both. So uh, this is a, a divide of uh, fuels that have been used by rural and urban population so rural poor uh, they have uh, some of them have access to lpg but they use it very very sparingly and uh, because mainly because of the cost and uh, non availability of the cook stoves uh, rural affluent they will still use firewood for water heating but they'll also use lpg and uh, solar or biogas whichever is available to them uh, I, but the, the percentage is again very low. In urban areas, again, uh, urban poor will have access to LPG. Most of them have it, but they will use it very sparingly. And our, with urban poor, the problem is they burn anything that is available, including plastic, rubber, whatever is available, they will burn it as a uh, fuel for cooking. 
and urban affluent obviously they they are the only ones currently who are, who are using electricity in their kitchens but that also it's mainly for uh, the kettles uh, or for teapot and uh, induction cookers are used cook stoves are used very sparingly when lpg is not available or they have to do a variety of things microwaves and air fryer kind of things are used uh, in a large uh, numbers and uh, then obviously uh, i've lost the slides i uh, fell up on my screen here yeah it's still the same on the fuel stacking one <laughs> okay yeah here it is so uh, so the uh, so these are the fuel uh, stacking uh, the tendency that every household has so they will at least have minimum a combination of minimum two or three fuels that are used so uh, when we are talking about clean cooking we have to clean up the stack like it has to be lpg plus electricity plus solar or biochar plus electricity plus uh, maybe improved cook stove using pellets or biogas so when when we cleanse the uh, or the stack then uh, that gives a holistic solution and addresses all of the concerns that is one learning that we have had uh, next slide please so then we have come up with uh, three uh, solutions uh, which address the which address most of the issues one is conducting demonstrations so we are con uh, conducting demonstrations which help for customer education uh, we also understand their financial needs and understand operational challenges so when we say demonstrations what we do is we carry all the cooking devices to uh, a cluster of villages and then we spend say a weeks time or so in those villages and demonstrate uh, all the cooking devices that is we cook on each of the cooking devices and then we have kind of a group lunch or something like that and then they ask questions about each of the uh, devices and how they can uh, purchase them where they are av available and if they can uh, use the devices as trial devices so these all questions come up but they get an interaction to all the available cooking choices that they have next we move to the livelihood uh, uh solution sorry to interrupt i'm yeah. i'm just aware of the fact that we've run to the end of our allotted time today um but we haven't yet finished your presentation or had a chance for discussion so um if yeah. people need to to leave to go to, to other meetings then then please feel free to drop off i'd like to propose that we run for another 15 minutes so we have time to complete for you complete your presentation and then ask some cross cutting questions at the end so if you need to leave now then 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 please do feel Free, feel free to do so um but yeah let's let's continue um for another 15 minutes or so uh, thank you so much i'll just try to uh, squeeze it as early as possible this is the last slide so um for the livelihood options uh, that is one of the most uh, inspiring way people want to use uh, clean cooking devices so for example uh, if we try to teach them to uh, make some jams pickles or some food products on the on the clean cooking devices uh, as a group of women come together and start using uh, or start this clean cook stoves uh, station and they start cooking food on it and uh, selling it or selling the food products or maybe some uh, semi cooked uh, food products then that acts as a very good incentive for uh, inspiring people to adopt to clean cooking and uh, it also helps to create a local market and that led us to our next solution that was the clean cook stove shops we call them ujjaksham which means the energy enabled uh, so uh, the clean cook stove shops is something that is the missing link uh, to give the confidence to the end user so if you have a stable shop uh, in a cluster of four or five villages which uh, which kind of sells all kinds of clean cooking devices including the clean cooking fuels so you know if you have a charging system out there or uh, and then they are also backed up by the financial models of emi rent borrow or donate as well so there are people who would like to donate their clean cook stoves also to rural population so these cook uh, stove shops actually act as uh, the uh 
one stop shop for all the clean cooking requirements of those particular four or five villages and uh, the repair and maintenance also uh, is available through these shops so at least they will know whether their device is repairable or they have to buy a new one or is there any exchange offer available then there are migrant families in rural communities who migrate for agric after their agricultural uh, season is over they migrate to either cities or to other areas to find work so they do not want to have anything permanent kind of a cooking solution with them so for them uh, the borrow model actually helps a lot so we have piloted this uh, model in a couple of ways we are we have also started doing it online and we have received interest from all sections of the society because they want to try uh, different types of cooking uh, solutions and yes everyone wants to move up in the ladder in the uh, clean cooking uh, sector but it's just that there has to be some uh, hand holding on ground so unless that doesn't happen then uh, it will be a very slow uh, conversion rate uh, which is available so as earlier uh, one of our speakers said that availability of the cookers itself uh, sometimes apc is sometimes is a challenge that and I, unless i see my neighbors or my friends using it i will not adopt it so that is the general behavioral uh, stigma or uh, mind block that is there uh, so uh, through these clean cook stove shops we are trying to address all of these issues Uh, so with this, I end my presentation, and uh, uh, we are open for uh, collaborations. Next slide, please. Uh, we are open for collaboration uh, with whoever wants to, if they want to, uh, kind of set up the clean cook stove shops or uh, get a template on doing activities, uh, the demonstrations. We are happy to connect with everyone. So uh, we are open for questions in that way. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Vishika, and thank you, thank you to each of our presenters um, for a very diverse range of um, business models that that they've been able to share with us. That I hope will be able to kind of provide some inspiration for how you could potentially reach out into new markets and, and tackle this challenge of overcoming the affordability gap. So I'd like to to start with some of the questions that I've seen in in the chat. In particular, a question from from Dili Gimaya, who has asked. Well, a lot of our our um, presentations are focused on financing for appliances themselves, but his question was, how do people get financing to increase rural electrification, so access to electricity itself? Um, so, can I ask any of our any of our panel members who would like to take that to, to unmute and and please go ahead? What, what is the question? How can they have access to electricity? These are the questions. So the question is, how do people get financing to get access to electricity? They so don't. I think you'd probably be a really good person to, to answer that. They don't. That. They don't, right? They don't. The electricity. We... I mean, yeah. we, we get it for our, our business model through there's some connection incentives uh, through the World Bank and the government of Haiti uh, and then some blended finance that we bring to the table. Um, and in our areas uh, in, in Haiti, um, people are saving 50 to 80 percent switching to electricity um, because the energy alternatives are so expensive in rural Haiti. That is not the case in, in a lot of markets, um, but um, like in terms of finance for the individual customers, um, we, we bring our prices lower to them by getting um, external blended finance, um, but they don't get direct financing themselves, at least not for our model in Haiti. I think, Rosia, I also wanted to point to one of your earlier slides where you had um, amongst your range of products that you're you're offering alongside cooking devices, also solar systems. So in that yeah. sense, then that that is one way that financing is provided for for yeah. electricity access. And the other the other point I perhaps wanted to, to um, pull up was around the the grid extension program in in Kenya. So there's a a concept that they that Kenya Power, the national utility, have used to extend access to electricity from 
uh, five five years ago, it was just a quarter of the population who had access to electricity, and now three quarters have access. They use a concept called steamer loans, whereby they they enabled customers to connect to their grid and pay the connection fee off at the same time as they're paying their electricity units. So they pay it on a financing plan. So in that sense, I think that perhaps addresses the the question around how can you get finance to connect to electricity in the first place to then be able to consider using a, an electric cooking appliance. Uh, we have a question coming in from Nancy. Um, Nancy was asking, are there any lessons that you have learned on the role of gender in the acquisition of electric pressure cookers in particular? Um, I can take that one as uh, we have a gender focused company and we measure this um, in detail. Um, it's less obvious in terms of the thing is that we don't have enough statistics to really draw conclusions with 300 points. Uh, it's hard to extrapolate. Uh, however, compared to uh, what we are doing in the LPG side and the efficient cook stoves, uh, where we have like thousands of data points, they, they, anything to do with cooking has a gender impact, which is massive. Um, and the rule of thumb is if it's easy to use and it doesn't take too much time to cook, the uh, husbands will participate. As, as simple as that. And I'm obviously I'm exaggerating and extrapolating, but at the end of the day, um, when we look at our data, uh, especially for the LPG, is is very balanced. So just to give you a, a flavor of what we do, 75% of our clients, the people signing the contract are women across the board. However, when we looked at the LPG, that 75% becomes something like 60%. So it would be 60, 40%. So for our target market, the men participate in the LPG more than any other products that we are selling, including agricultural products, including solar products because they also use LPG. We don't have enough data for the EPC. We only have 300 clients and 80 something percent, 85 percent are women. Um, I don't know yet. I cannot really tell you. The LPG ladies say even my husband can prepare breakfast because it's about uh, reheating uh, a meal that has been already produced and that's what the main uh, use of LPG is. I haven't heard that yet in the EPC, but um, probably some matter of statistics. I, I, I am positive about the gender impact, but I have to measure it first. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. I think we've seen across a number of projects that there is initial interest from men in, in cooking in a way that there hasn't been in, in, with improved cook stoves in that by making cooking easier, it can, it can change the the responsibilities within the household of who does the cooking, um, something that can enable you to just press a button and, and reheat food or cook a simple recipe to make it attractive to other family members and perhaps can act as a, as a purchasing trigger um, to encourage more families um, or different types of customers to, to start purchasing devices, as well as the cooking responsibilities in, in households where uh, women are currently the dominant cooks to perhaps be shared a little bit more equally amongst uh, the, the other members of the household. Um, John, I'd like one to thing that Karen or Melinda. Sorry, or go ahead. Yeah, sorry, go on, Andy. Uh, just was adding that uh, uh, on that, it's it's uh, it's a perception thing as well. We uh, really integrated uh, uh, our male technicians uh, for our grids into doing cooking demonstrations um, at our at our training events for um, for participants, which um, we believe, um, we don't have the data to back it up, but we believe that it does help um, in sort of normalizing that and showing um, showing the ease and effectiveness. And, and, and so a, a number of our participants um, reported that um, there were there was significant male participation uh, within the households, which may or may not have been there um, be before, um, and and some of that is a result of just kind of breaking the perception barrier, I suppose. Absolutely, yeah. Um, Karen or Melinda or anyone else from the gender inclusivity, leave no one behind, but Jake Lindbeck, 
Um, I know we had some very insightful comments from you on the, on the webinar we had a few weeks ago um, on the forgotten half um, kind of men's contribution to um, the purchasing decisions around hook stoves. Um, so is, is there anything that you would like to add to the discussion at this point? Well, uh, yes, thank you, John. I am Karin. And yes, I, I think that what, what we have to keep in mind is that men are an important part of the decision making then it's always very important to consider them. It, it varies a lot from country to country and from context to context, because in some countries, men are engaged in collecting, for example, the firewood. And in those cases, then they would be maybe interested in, in, in saving a few. And you know, in most contexts, in most countries, they will be very, very important regarding the use of the budget or the family budget then for, for sure it is important to consider them. We have found in other in, in, in some studies that they will be like the important their opinion will be very important regarding what is cooked and if they consider that the, the food is not as taste, tasteful or is not done on time and or there are some problems with regarding that, that can affect decision too. Fantastic. Thank you, Karen. So I'm just conscious of time. So I'm just going to come to one last question. Um, it's from Melinda. So Melinda's question, um, which I think at the time was aimed at Rocio, but I think it also applies to, to other presenters as well. Um, her question was, what are the financial implications on, on women if the EPCs or other, uh, other modern cooking devices malfunction and break? Who is responsible for repairs? So maybe Rocio, I could pass over to you first, yeah. and then some that's of the other yeah. could come I, in afterwards. That's a really good question because we are distributors, so um, we sit in the middle. So we we have to have our aim is to have happy clients. Therefore, first rule is only sell high quality products, so you reduce the future problems. Second rule is that supplier has a reverse logistics process in place in country. So when things go wrong, they are able to honor their warranties because all these products come with a warranty. So uh, we make a lot of effort on uh, when we select the technology slash the brand slash the manufacturer, manufacturer and importer uh, to make sure that they are able to deal with um, uh, repairs and warranty swaps if needed. Um, that's the theory. The practice is that it's really difficult uh, on the ground. Most people fail on the reverse logistics. There is no enough incentives for the manufacturer or the importer to have good facilities in country to ease up the uh, process of a repair or a warranty swap. So it's a lot of work there to do. Uh, what we do is we try to make good the client as soon as possible, as soon as feasible with our own uh, spare materials and spare products. Uh, and then we pick up a fight with the importer instead of sending the client directly to the importer and good luck to you. Um, like it would happen if you buy a Samsung phone, they would say, go to the Samsung shop. You don't go to your little retail shop and say, I have a problem with my Samsung. So we, we try to make the life of the client a bit easier, but uh, it's still a journey. It's, it's not perfect by any means. Thanks, Rosia. Am I Andy or Vishika? Would any of you like to, to comment on that question? Yeah, I can quickly jump in. And my answer is similar to uh, along Rosia's lines because we're kind of acting as distributors as well. But treating these activities as a market test, we also want to absorb the risk. So the reverse logistics, they might take a lot of time and you know they depend on our distributor but in the meanwhile we do make an effort to as quickly as possible replace the product with a new one and also manage uh, manage this issue by choosing and testing first uh, the choice of of the products that we choose to to sell and market 
Uh, yeah, we take the same approach. We, we absorb the risk for our customers and purchase ad additional pressure cookers and additional um, induction stoves so that we could make repairs on site or replacements on, on site because we knew, especially with logistics to Haiti, that it was going to be impractical and in basically infeasible to have um, our customers like wait to, to get um, the replacement. We could deal with the warranty and stuff on the back end, um, but we needed to have extra supply and extra extra parts um, as part of our operations to enable effective service. So we, we, we took on that risk. Thanks, Andy. Vizika, anything to add? Uh, we have a similar uh, strategy because that's the only way out right now. So uh, nothing much to add to it, actually. Thanks. Great, thank you. So I think I'd like to close uh, just by by uh, reading out a comment that we got from Joseph Fernandez, um, which ties into actually this theme of, of reliability and quality of equipment. Because um, Joe's company, Solagio, was the winner of the small EPC category in the Global Leap Awards, which is the competition I mentioned earlier, which went through and tested a number of different electric pressure cookers that are currently available on the market. And one of the things we tested for was durability. Um, so that we can find which products are likely to be most reliable um, and then promote these in uh, for, for use in, in various projects around the world um, as appliances which are likely to, to last much longer. So I'm going to put a, a link to the Global Leap Awards in the chat there so you can have a look at the buyer's guide which is designed to showcase the models that made it through to the final of the, of the competition. Um, the, the comment from, from Joseph was, my compliments to all the presenters. I attended a number of webinars, many of which are marginally insightful. Perhaps it's the relative novelty of electric cooking. In any regard, each presentation has been very insightful. So I think this just goes to show that there are uh, there is a huge opportunity opening up here for, for marketing electric cooking um, in these emerging um, markets, um, which have conventionally been discounted. Um, but really, we can see there is a huge opportunity here. It's just a question of getting the, the marketing right, getting the messages right, um, and most importantly, being able to demonstrate these products. I think what we've seen cutting across all of these presentations is that it's, it's not enough to simply put a, a product on a supermarket shelf. You really need to go the extra mile and be able to demonstrate that this is a safe product, it's, it's affordable, um, and it can cook local foods. And to do that, you really need to show people firsthand they need to be able to see, smell, and taste the food that it's cooked. It's not easy to be able to do this in a cost-effective way, but I think we've been able to show four approaches to this in the session today. So I hope that this will this will prompt um, further collaboration between the attendees of the webinar today. Um, I think the details of, of how to touch were sent round um, with the, the invite to the, to the session. So please do contact uh, Nick Rousseau, who is the organizer of the, the webinar series on the on the affordability gap. If you'd like to, to connect directly with any of these um, people who have joined the webinar today or any of our other partners. And um, we have another webinar coming up on the 6th of July, uh, the next in the series, which is specifically on consumer financing. Um, so I think for me, that's all today. Let me pass over to Nick um, if you'd like to say any final words to close the session today. Uh, no, I'm conscious of how much time people have put in. So, no, I think it's been amazing. I think it's been really, really positive. Um, and, and as you said, John, it kind of shows the, that there are some well-developed and well-tested methods out there that are successful. So that's good. Thank you very much, everyone. Hopefully see you on the 6th of July. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye -bye. Thanks. See you.